I think uh, we've heard uh, a number of times today, and we're very familiar from a number of uh, contexts of various reasons why uh, our picture of uh, space and time uh, break down. Um, uh, think first recognize, and just thinking about um, how very, very high energy scattering eventually ceases to probe shorter and shorter distances because of gravity and starts probing longer and longer distances again. Uh, puzzles about what happens when you fall into a black hole. And perhaps um, most pressingly, in thinking about every aspect of cosmology. Uh, very early times, we have uh, initial singularities we don't know how to deal with. And especially if we, uh, uh, if we, if we like uh, this picture of the eternally inflating multiverse as, uh, as uh, somehow there and the only sensible uh, path we have to understanding the cosmological constant, um, then uh, we also don't know how to apply quantum mechanics to the very, very late universe and, uh, and say anything sensible uh, 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 about it so far. Um, uh, well, for a number of years, I, I've at least personally strongly believed that it isn't just space-time that's uh, got to be emergent, but it's uh, space-time and quantum mechanics that have to emerge hand in hand from uh, some more primitive uh, degrees of freedom. Um, and that's uh, what I want to uh, uh, talk about in the rest uh, uh, of the talk. Now, um, the uh, quite lowbrow attitude I've taken to this subject is, uh, I think at least it's certainly beyond the limitations of my puny brain to try to guess what the actual structure is of the uh, whatever is going to replace space-time in a complete and deep sense. But if it's really gone, if space-time and quantum mechanics really emerge from something else, I think it's such a big thing that it has to leave its effects every uh, and even away from these extreme situations involving gravity, cosmology, singularities, and so on, there should be some way of talking about even ordinary physics, completely ordinary standard physics, um, uh, where we don't make such heavy use of these ideas, even though in that context they're exact. In that context of ordinary quantum field theories, they are exact. And this dovetails very nicely with many of the things Nati was mentioning in his talk. We have lots of other indications of, uh, and a desire for quantum field theory to be reformulated in some way, perhaps in some other language. Uh, since space-time and quantum mechanics are the two ingredients that go into the very definition of what a quantum field theory is, it stands to reason that some other way of thinking about what quantum field theory is is going to involve uh, an understanding of space-time somehow being, uh, space-time and quantum mechanics being derived features from something else. And so the goal has been for the past uh, six, seven years or so uh, to, to, to look for that, to, 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 to look for this um, in the structure of uh, uh, standard observables in, uh, in, in, in ordinary situations in ordinary theories. Um, and so let me first very quickly talk about um, uh, uh, this in the context of thinking about scattering amplitudes. Um, so I spoke about this at the uh, analogous symposium here last year. Um, uh, here we have a completely ordinary process. We even need to think about it in calculating um, physical observables at the LHC, uh, multi-gluon scattering amplitudes. The standard way of thinking about this physics that Feynman uh, gave us for that process that I drew there would involve hundreds and hundreds of pages of algebra. Uh, those pictures are hardwiring in the principles of relativity and quantum mechanics as manifestly as possible. That's what you get if you try to make these principles as manifest as you can. Um, but people have been studying these things for many years, first finding tricks for simplifying the calculations. Um, and then as time goes on, it seems that these tricks aren't really tricks. They're, they're, they're indications, shadows, of another formulation, another picture, another autonomous a mathematical question to which scattering amplitudes are the answer, uh, which does not involve uh, unitary evolution through space-time, but involves the answer to another question. Now, for the very special case of uh, the maximally supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions and the planar limit, planar n equals four super Yang mills, uh, my collaborators and I for the past five years have unearthed this structure, which is exactly, uh, has this character. So instead of talking about unitary evolution through space-time, someone hands you the external data, the momenta and helicities of the gluons that are scattering, and from that data you build a shape in an auxiliary space. Uh, we call the shape the amplitohedron. You compute the volume of the amplitohedron and you're done. That's the scattering amplitude. The fact that these things deserve the name scattering amplitude is because they have sharp properties that reflect that they're local and unitary. That locality and unitarity is not put in by hand, but is actually a consequence of the, uh, of the geometry of the amplitohedron. So 
So it's a very limited uh, toy problem. But in this toy problem, we see very sharply, not vaguely, very sharply the idea that space time and quantum mechanics, or said less, uh, less grandiosely, very, but very literally, the locality and unitarity of these functions is a consequence of something else that, that we don't put in by hand. And the fact that this is possible is, uh, I think, at least strongly encourages me to believe that this should be possible in general. OK. So, um, so uh, now, um, what I'd like to do is, uh, is uh, now move on from, uh, from uh, scattering amplitudes and try to ask analogous questions in cosmology. After all, we don't live. Those were the original motivations. The deepest motivations about emergent uh, uh, space time and quantum mechanics go back to uh, cosmology. Uh, we don't live in flat space. We live in, uh, in a cosmology. And I'd like to pursue uh, exactly this kind of program now instead of for scattering amplitudes for cosmology. But, uh, but before going on, I want to make one more comment about uh, uh, amplitudes. I, I should say that the pushing this forward is something which is going to go on for, for the next five years or so, it's definitely on the table to just try to solve for all the scattering amplitudes of n equals four super Yang mills in the planar limit. You know, the people working in this field using these ideas and many other ideas, or they smell blood in the water. There's, uh, people can compute things uh, today that two years ago would have seemed completely insane. So, so I, I think it's completely reasonable to expect that on this sort of five-year time scale, these things will just be solved and we'll have, we'll have uh, and so with some, some degree of uh, control uh, and understanding of, of what the amplitudes are. And there's obvious things to do. Generalize. Less supersymmetric theories beyond the planar limit, gravity, and so on. Uh, but um, what I want to do in, in the rest of the talk is uh, uh, talk about four quite concrete um, uh, questions uh, that, that I think uh, the time is ripe for to think about um, in the next five years. And before moving on from a scattering amplitudes, I want to mention one of these questions related to string theory and uh, scattering amplitudes. Um, this really seems like something like someone might just be able to solve this problem you know, next week. Someone very smart might be able to solve it quickly. Um, and uh, um, so the, uh, the, the, the broad question is, just like we've learned to think about scattering amplitudes without using Lagrangians and gauge redundancies and so on, um, it, it, it seems reasonable to expect that one might be able to do the same thing with perturbative string amplitudes, start learning how to think about perturbative string amplitudes without the world sheet. And in fact, uh, there's a more general question, which is, uh, can we actually prove, that the, and it's, it's a sharply posed mathematical problem, can we actually prove that string theory is the unique, weakly coupled UV completion of gravity? So what I mean by that is uh, uh, saying that it's weakly coupled means that there's some quote unquote tree approximation to the two to two scattering amplitude. That tree approximation should only have poles. It should have the miraculous feature that on the residue of any pole, you can express it as a sum over the exchange of spin s particles with positive coefficients. Um, and so can you write down a two to two amplitude that doesn't blow up as you go to high energies, uh, which has all positive residues? The conjecture is that there is essentially a unique answer to this question. I can explain the star later to anyone who's interested, but the unique answer is the Verisora Shapiro amplitude. And uh, I think this is a complete, this is a question you can hand a mathematician. Um, and um, uh, um, right now, the only way we know of showing even that this is uh, unitary, that the residues are positive, is through all the usual indirect uh, arguments involving uh, world sheet BRS, uh, supersymmetry, and string theory, and so on. Um, but there might be another way of arriving at this uh, answer, and that other way might be related to a less world sheet centered way of thinking about what uh, string scattering amplitudes are. And so, so uh, just, just to go back, what we'll see in the rest of the talk is a lot of pictures like this with some object on the left. Oh, this doesn't work. Some object on the left, which is something that's standard from some language, and some arrow with some hope for something analogous to this on the right, okay? Some other picture for what it is on the right. And so here, the question is, we have this, these beautiful pictures of string world sheets on the left. What could there be on the right, which, uh, which uh, computes them in a, in, a, in a very different way? But I want to move on to uh, uh, the heart of the matter and talk about um, uh, the analogous questions in, uh, in uh, cosmology. In a space time that's asymptotically flat, we all know the only observable that we can talk about is the S matrix. Um, that's great. The S matrix is great. This, of course, is very closely related to experiments we do in particle physics. Um, and we get to control the initial state. Um, 
And the S matrix also, because we understand it so well, it has a wonderful feature that if uh, someone just tells you they got it somehow, they didn't tell you how they got it. They just said, here it is. My grandma gave it to me. Okay, here is, here is the uh, S matrix. You can check. You can check whether they're right or wrong. Okay? Is it Lorentz invariant? Is S dagger S equals one? We know the rules. We know what the consistency conditions are ahead of time. Now, in cosmology, uh, the observables that we get to talk about, if, if, if we imagine not quite our universe, but a universe that expands out to be infinitely large, the only observables that we can talk about, um, precise observables we can talk about, is we can sort of lie on our back and look at the night sky. Uh, we don't get to choose the initial state. We get what we get. Um, but fortunately, if the universe becomes infinitely large, the experiment is done infinitely many times in different places. We can do spatial averages across everything we see in the night sky, and those correlate those uh, experiments that are done on a single state at late infinite time, um, uh, something you could also call the wave function of the universe or uh, late time uh, correlation functions, um, those are the only things we get to uh, talk about. So what fraction of stars are red? What fraction are blue? After you sort that out, if there's a red star and a blue star next to each other, how often is a green star 100 kiloparsecs away from it? And so on. Okay, So we can make all those uh, distributions. And now the question of suppose someone claims that they're done. Okay, here it is. They hand you the wave function of the universe. Now, how, how do you check if they're right or wrong? What are the consistency conditions? What are the rules? Uh, in, in more familiar settings, uh, we have an intuitive idea what this is about. This is what every historical science is about, after all. Cosmology is just the most uh, sophisticated historical science. But if you're a, if you're a paleontologist, um, uh, uh, Every historical science is about inferring patterns of correlations in space in, at the present and deducing the existence of some past as the only way to make sense of them. So you see some funny pattern in the fossil record and you say, aha, that's because there was a dinosaur walking around here and it ate another dinosaur next to it. Or, uh, or if you're a detective, you say that person X murdered person Y because uh, today in their hand there's a gun uh, uh, and the bullet from that gun is in the body of person Y. So therefore, uh, yes, Yesterday, person X killed person Y. Every uh, historical science is about trying to explain, uh, 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 about um, interpreting a past in order to explain pattern of correlations in the present. And we have some intuitive idea of what those, uh, of what those patterns are supposed to be. But we don't know what the precise rules are in a cosmology. What are the rules for cosmological correlators? And a more specific question is, how is microphysics and um, ultraviolet consistency encoded in these rules? Okay? Well, again, we all have the feeling that cosmology arises from microphysics. The microphysics, perhaps for the reasons we talked about before, the only weakly coupled UV completion there would even be stringy. But how is all of that information encoded in the actual uh, cosmological observables. Now, um, uh, these, these cosmological correlators, of course, uh, get a lot more uh, uh, importance experimentally because this is what the uh, present and future of cosmology is going to be for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, all of the excitement in cosmology for the past 20 years is about measuring two-point functions of, uh, uh, of uh, temperature fluctuations in the sky. And in the next uh, two or three or four decades, we're going to be measuring three-point functions and perhaps even higher point functions. And in our head, we can imagine trying to compute um, uh, multi-higher point uh, correlators. Now, you stare at these diagrams, and so quite, quite literally speaking, we, we, we can imagine going to momentum space. They have a very similar character to scattering amplitudes. Uh, there are functions of spatial momenta, a bunch of them which add up to zero, just like scattering amplitudes. The only difference with scattering amplitudes is there's no delta function for overall energy conservation. There's no actual particles here. Okay? So there's, in fact, slightly more information, one more variable information in these cosmological correlators than there are in scattering amplitudes. Um, uh, also, when you actually try to do these computations, it's just like scattering amplitudes. You use Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams are horrible. There are tremendous cancellations in all the answers. The final results are much simpler than the uh, diagrams looks. Where have we heard that story before? Okay, so that, that fact in the context of scattering amplitudes was, the, was uh, foreshadowing the existence of some second picture for computing them. And the hope is that we'll first, by studying these uh, correlators, we will understand what, start to understand, at least in perturbation theory, what the consistency conditions are that we should be looking for. And that secondly, we might find a second structure, a different question to which these correlators are the answer. And in the case of scattering amplitudes, that was a more limited understanding of emergent space time. This would be a quite much more little understanding of emergent time, because that's, uh, that's the thing that we're replacing in doing these computations. So 
Question number two is the first uh, uh, step in this direction, which is um, we might imagine that we just have the good old fashioned Yang Mills fields in a four dimensional the sitter space. Uh, because Yang Mills fields are conformally coupled, the computation of these cosmological correlators for Yang Mills fields is in fact identical to the computation in flat space. And these computations in flat space have another name. They're simply the vacuum wave function in flat space of, of the theory. So we can try to calculate the vacuum wave function in, for instance, n equals four uh, planar super Yang Mills. Okay? That's one step towards uh, cosmology. In fact, if, if it, as I said, if it was four dimensional de Sitter space, this would be part of the four dimensional uh, cosmological correlators. And um, it, it's, a, it's a very simple technical, but quite beautiful. Uh, th that's right, they're not scattering amplitudes. The, the, no, but now I'm gonna tell you how they're related to scattering amplitudes. They're intimately related to a scattering amplitude. This is just the vacuum wave function, right? We're just computing the vacuum wave function. But this object contains a scattering amplitude in a very beautiful and simple way. You see, if you imagine computing all the Feynman diagrams that would contribute to this object, it has one obvious singularity where all the time vertices go off to minus infinity together. In that limit, there's a pole. Uh, where the, when the sum of all the energies adds up to zero. That's outside the physical region, but you can reach it by analytically continuing the energies. So that's some are positive and some are negative. And the residue of that pole is precisely the S matrix. So this object, which contains one extra degree of freedom, actually contains the, all of the S matrix as, 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 as a pole in one variable. So since the S matrix has all this wonderful magic in it, it's very hard to believe that all of the magic disappears the second you go off this co-dimension one surface. It's much more likely that there's some, there's some beautiful structure which is, uh, which is uh, producing uh, the answers also for the cosmological correlators. So that's the first warm up case, even for planar n equals four super Yang mills. Next, we can ask whether there is analogous magic now in honest cosmology. If we have gravity, non conformally coupled fields, massive particles. Um, but again, th it's the same basic uh, strategy. Uh, start computing these things in perturbation theory, gather data, stare at them, and start seeing if they're the answer to a different question. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, uh, this, is, this is most speculative of all because here we don't even know the rules. Uh, but there is another sharply posed question here. I, I, I don't think I have time to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, describe uh, how, how sharply posed it is. But, uh, but there's the analog of the question that I, that I asked in the very beginning about scattering amplitudes. Um, is, it, is string theory the unique UV completion, weakly coupled UV completion of a gravity? Well, there we have the advantage of having a theory already. We have one formulation of the theory already. But we can ask the analogous question here in uh, cosmology. Is it possible to, to find a four-point correlation function uh, which, which, uh, uh, which doesn't have difficulties in the UV. Now that we know where we're supposed to hunt for the difficulties in the UV, uh, the structure of a singularity is the sum of all the energies adds up to zero, there's a very natural conjecture for what happens if the physics is stringy. Namely, there is no such singularity there. Okay? And that, that, gives a, that's, uh, that gives a completely well-posed mathematical question. Again, I have no idea if, if it has an answer. In this, in this case, we don't have the luxury of, uh, of knowing whether there is or isn't a world sheet description of a cosmology. But, but it's something I think very interesting to, uh, to uh, think about, and again, a very concrete problem. Yeah, but, but I, I think as, as, we've, as we've discussed before, those questions are much closer to, to scattering amplitudes. This is, uh, this is a little more off shell than things that, that at least we had talked about before. All right, that's, that's all I have to say. I just want to end with one final question, um, which is, uh, is the LHC going to completely upend these plans? <laughs> and I really, really hope so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Questions for Nima. Nati. A question that I already asked you, but I'll ask again. I didn't understand the relation between two different things you said at the beginning. You said that you replace space time with the amplitudehedron, probably mispronounce it, where you compute some volume in some other right. space, so we don't have space time, instead you have that. Right. And then in the next slide, you asked a question about gravity. How can we get rid of the world sheet and find something else? Isn't that exactly the reverse, namely 
the story with the amplitude the hedron is exactly the story with the wall sheet, it, where there is no space time, but instead you integrate over some other space. That, that, yeah. So there's 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 some analogy, of course, um, but but I think uh, since since the since the world sheet picture is much more recognizably connected to uh, to thickening Feynman diagrams, I think what's going on with the amplitude is is much is, I mean it's it's quite a bit further removed from the from the picture of a space time scattering process than 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 that, but uh, but regardless, you you could you could. Uh, um, uh, I don't need to be internally consistent. It's, uh, so uh, I, I think it is, it is an interesting, it is a very interesting question whether it's possible to determine. I mean, just like people talk about the uh, bootstrap program for determining correlation functions, it's a very concrete problem whether there's an analog for, and in fact, it's a simpler problem. It's a much simpler mathematical problem whether there's the analogous question. The, the, I, should, I should stress, as you know, but if, to, to maybe students here who might not know, the real miracle of these formulas is that they're unitary. The real miracle of these formulas is that uh, when you sit on a pole in the, uh, in, 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 in the S channel, that the numerator amazingly expands out into the sum of uh, Legendre polynomials with positive coefficients. And that, it's an incredibly simple uh, mathematical identity you can write down, but you try to prove it directly. And uh, well, maybe one of our mathematician friends here could, could prove it uh, on the flight back to their home institutions, in which case they should let us know. <laughs> but uh, uh, but that, that very simple identity, the only proof of those identities we know involve all the machinery of the, of the world sheet description of string theory. If there is another proof, if there's another understanding of where those things come from, I think it would be a really big deal. Any other questions for Nima? Juan? Is it easy to take the top limit of the amphitrohedron, uh, the it, large end limit, and see the world sheet emerging? Well, that's, uh, as, 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 as you know well, um, uh, we're in the large end limit already. Um, but uh, but uh, the, the, the picture so far is very perturbative. So, so at any loop order, there is a shape, and the shape is different as you go to a different and different loop orders. So that's one of many things that, uh, that uh, I mean, we also still don't know the direct relationship between the amplitohedron picture and the methods based on integrability, the methods that are more closely related to the world sheet description. But something that, uh, that gives us hope is that the amplitudron picture is the only picture we know of where all the symmetries of the theory are naked and are, and are there in your face. And that's only possible because it makes no connection, make no reference to either space-time description, nor the original space-time, nor the dual space-time. Uh, somehow, that's the, that's, that's the picture where all the symmetries are, are in your face. The fact that it's the answer to such a simple mathematical question on top of that makes it seem like the, the, the connection will, will, will not be trivial, but will be, but will, uh, um, uh, uh, that's one of the things that should hopefully come out. We should, we should see how the world sheet emerges from this picture. That's one of the things which is going to happen anyway in the next five years. I wanted to talk about things which, uh, which are less likely to happen in the next five years, but which I think are worth pursuing in the next five years. <laughs>